as I'm very fond of saying, today is day 3,400 of our 90-day mission to Mars. <laughs> and uh, opportunity is still going strong. This is a uh, front Hascam picture that came down a few hours ago. It shows the front view out of the, uh, the front end of the rover as it stands right now. And it would be easy to think all these later, years later that somehow the process of getting a rover to Mars was sensible was logical. It was not. And Robert gave you a sense of it. Um, believe it or not, there was a time when it was incredibly hard to convince people that sending a rover to Mars was a good idea. And part of the problem, I think, arose from this magnificent success, the Viking lander mission. Fantastic success. Great mission. But look at Mars. To many people, that was Mars absolutely flat with identical looking boulders stretching to the horizon in all directions. Why do you need a rover when all the rocks look alike? This was a battle that I fought for years and years and years. I spent 10 years from 1987 to 1997 writing a succession of proposals to NASA to try to do something like a rover mission to Mars. And each one of them was shot down in turn like so many clay pigeons. And finally, on the fourth try, we were selected. This was what our rover was going to look like at the time that we were selected. And it was actually part of a Mars sample return mission. This was a Mars sample return mission. It was we were going to launch in 2003. The samples were going to be back by now, 2013. We were going to launch the first rover in 2003, the second rover in 2005. The mission to return the samples was going to be launched in 2008, and they would be back on Earth by now. Here's our little rover hiding behind a rock so it doesn't get toasted while the Mars ascent vehicle takes off and sends the, robo the, the, the rocks uh, up to orbit. But then some bad things started to happen. The first bad thing that started to happen was NASA realized that we didn't have enough money to do this. And so the program sort of began to disintegrate. And at one, put, at one point they took our payload, which had been designed to go on a rover and they put it on this lander with this tiny little rover that would run around, but it didn't really go very far. This is like a geologist with his boots nailed to the ground. Okay, that was what this mission was going to be. Then things got worse. Uh, there were the missions, the, the two missions that were launched in 98. Climate Orbiter, Polar Lander, Mars Lander, Silent After Descent, NASA Chief, Future Mars Missions in Doubt. They wiped the slate clean. The entire Mars program was blown away. I had a completely calibrated, tested payload six weeks away from going to the loading dock at Lockheed Martin in Denver, and the mission was canceled. So we regrouped, and we came up with this cockamamie scheme of trying to put a rover inside the Pathfinder lander and land it with the Pathfinder airbags. This is the, the drawing of the MER rover as it was conceived at the time. This was with the press release that came out when they announced the selection of the mission. Notice that there's only one rover. Two came along later. And also, so there is no instrument arm. The artist kind of forgot that. But uh, this is what it looked like at that point. Once all was said and done, it looked more like this. And this is the rover that we all know and love with the six wheels and, and all the instruments on the payload and so forth. Now, the vehicle that we came up with to deliver this rover to Mars was based very much on the Mars Pathfinder vehicle. The rover in order to fit into that vehicle, had to fold up in this horrifyingly intricate fashion to fit inside the lander. The lander has these three petals on the side. We call them petals because they're like the petals of a flower. They fold up around the rover, encasing it, protecting it. So this is what the lander looks like when it's all folded up. It's very much like the Mars Pathfinder lander. It's then, in turn, encased in another shell. It's, this thing's built like one of those Russian doll sets, you know, where there's a doll inside a doll. It's like that. And this is in another shell, <coughs> which is composed of the heat shield and the back shell. And in this kind of Frisbee-looking deal on the back end, that we call the cruise stage. And it has propulsion and uh, electrical power, the stuff you need to get you to Mars. So here's what it looks like, all buttoned up. This is the Spirit spacecraft uh, at a JPL on a thermal vacuum test. Now. To land on Mars, you got to deal with the fact that you arrived there going really fast. We hit the top of the Martian atmosphere going Mach 27, 27 times the speed of sound. 
the heat shield leads off that kinetic energy. And then once you slow down to a nice leisurely Mach 2, you throw out a supersonic parachute. We learned the hard way that supersonic parachutes are very difficult things to design and build. The lander descends on the long cord, and this is what the vehicle looks like as it's still screaming down towards the Martian surface at about 300 kilometers or an hour. You do not drift down lazily on a parachute on Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. We had a horrible time with the parachutes. I remember this very well. This was the first test that we did of the parachute design that we thought was going to land us on Mars. We did this test at a National Guard gunnery range outside of, outside of Boise, Idaho. It's the kind of place where you can drop big, heavy things from the sky and they won't kill anybody. And we dropped our test article from a helicopter at 4,000 feet, deployed the parachute, it blossomed, made this perfect orange and white bowl, and it just exploded. It just ripped into ribbons, and parachute after parachute failed. What had happened was the vehicle by the time we got to these tests, our estimate of its mass had become so high, it was so heavy, that the parachute could not land it. So we had to embark on a crash program of parachute redesign, designing three parachute designs in parallel, praying that one of them would work. We did these tests at uh, NASA Ames Research Center in a wind tunnel, and we finally did get one of them to work. This is the actual parachute design that landed us on Mars. We finally got this design to work eight months before we had to be on top of the rockets in Florida. It was horrifying. We land using airbags, okay, just like the airbags in your car, except a lot what? That's an airbag engineer at JPL being consumed by his work. <laughs> they, they inflate explosively around the vehicle and they drop to the surface and they bounce and they bounce and they bounce and they roll and they roll and they can bounce and roll as much as a kilometer before they come to rest. Um, this is from our first airbag test, and you can sort of, you've had days like this, right? You can sort of tell from the looks on their faces it's not going real well. We tested these bags, and when we tested them, they just burst. They just exploded. And again, what had happened was the vehicle had become too heavy. So we had to add more layers to the bags to strengthen them, which of course made them heavier, which made the parachute problem worse, and so forth and so on. We did get it to work. This is, uh, a picture for one of our successful tests, and of course the ultimate test, these are actually airbag bounce marks on the surface of Mars. It was nice to see. You can almost see the, the stitching in the seam. So once this thing lands, the lander opens up, lifts itself upright, and then this rover doesn't look anything like a rover yet. It's still stowed inside, and it's got to now do origami in reverse, <laughs> unfolding itself and turning itself into a proper rover. And there's so many gears and motors and springs and hinges and latches that have to work just right during this process. I mean, what you see right now, these are the solar arrays coming out. These are the life-giving solar arrays, which if they do not deploy the first day on Mars, we don't survive the first night on Mars. The camera mast comes up, the antenna goes out, and by the time it gets to this configuration, the vehicle is safe. Everything you just saw happens in the first hour or two after landing. So now we got sunlight, we can take pictures. We can't go anywhere yet though because the whole suspension system is still stowed underneath the vehicle. There's more to come and it's worse. Watch this. There's this jack, like the jack in a car that lifts this thing up and then watch what the front wheels do. <laughs> I mean, all these years later, I still get the heebie-jeebies watching that. Um, if those latches don't latch, you're done. Everybody in this room has seen the famous Curiosity, Six Minutes of Terror, that cockamamie, crazy, terrifying looking sky crane system. Part of the reason that was designed so, was so we wouldn't have to do that again. <laughs> now we thought once we got to this point, with the rover standing up on the lander deck, we were good to go. We could just go monster trucking down onto the Mars surface and everything would be good. Then we did some tests. Yeah, this was a bad day. Um, <laughs> you drive one of these things off a lander, the rover can flip itself upside down. Another problem we had to solve. What we came up with, you saw in the video, we came up with these ramps. They're made out of fabric and they stow between the pedals. And then when the pedals open up, the rover 
is able to drive down the ramps that are formed by the fabric. It's made of the same fabric that the airbags are made of. Very tough stuff. Once you get on the Martian surface, you've got to deal with the fact that it ain't exactly paved. And so our mechanical engineers came up with this rocker bogey suspension system that was able to allow the six-wheel design to conform to the topography of the Martian surface. This shows how it works. Just watch the wheels. It's pretty slick. I mean, we find a corrugated, corrugated metal roof on Mars. We're, we're good. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a remarkable system. And it works. The process, I wish I could convey to you my memories of this and what it felt like to see things that had once been sketches on the whiteboard in my office begin to become engineering reality on the way to Mars before our eyes. That process of taking this concept and turning it into real flight hardware was a memory I will treasure for the rest of my life. We built the rovers, we tested them, and we had to ship them to the Cape. We put them all in a Atlas Van Lines truck. Rob Manning blew a stirring bugle call on his trumpet, and we drove it off to Florida, and then we unpacked. When we unpacked at the Cape, we had a lot of stuff, a lot of hardware. So this is the room at the Cape where we put everything together, and you can see bits and pieces of rover and flight system hardware all over the room. Now we had to put it together, but this time we're putting it together for the last time. And every connector that gets made at every fastener that gets tightened down, if you don't do it right, that's it. So very, very, very cautious, very painstaking work down at the Cape. This is making sure the rover will fit inside the lander. These, I thought I had an exciting job, these are the guys who have to mount the solid rocket motors <laughs> onto the vehicle. Um, they have a really exciting job. This has always been one of my favorite pictures uh, from the Cape. This is uh, Spirit in the foreground. That's me, opportunity in the background. This was media day. We brought all the world's media down, we got them all in the suits, and we brought them in here, and we set this thing up. We were going to command the rover to drive, to drive. The story that's not often told about this picture is that a minute or so after this picture was taken, the rover drove. This is a rover that's ready to go to Mars. We commanded a ro the rover to drive, and a washer fell from its belly onto that blue mat. You have never seen more freaked out engineers in your life. I still don't know where that washer came from. We just picked it up and put it away. <laughs> True story. I don't think anybody in the media caught it. It was, it was an ugly moment. <laughs> anyway, we buttoned it all up. This was the night, 2 o'clock in the morning. I remember driving behind this truck in my rented Chevy, 3 miles an hour, all the way out to the launch pad at dawn, watching them lift the thing up to the top. Uh, there are a lot of <coughs> downsides to being the principal investigator on a mission like this. There's a lot of reviews, a lot of meetings you got to go to, but there are a few decisions as PI that you get to make that are kind of nice. Um, one of the instruments on our payload required a dry nitrogen purge that was dry nitrogen that was flowing into the instrument to keep it dry until a matter of hours before launch when the purge had to be disconnected. It was important for somebody from the science team to be there and make sure that was done properly, and I decided that was the principal investigator's job. So the night before we launched, I got to actually go up to the top of the, top, top of the rocket and, and uh, watch them disconnect the purge. They did it just right. I never thought, it was 16 years between when I first started working on this and when we actually launched the things. It was 16 years just to get these things to the launch pad. But we launched them and we got them on their way to Mars. Now, <coughs> this shows the trajectory that we followed to Mars. It was about seven months. People who didn't know anything about spaceflight would say to me as the rovers were on their way, well, now you get seven months off before you have to start working hard again. Okay, another really ugly true story. When we launched Spirit and Opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, can somebody get me some, give me some water? When we launched Spirit and Opportunity, the software, the flight software for launch, cruise, and landing was on board the vehicle, fully tested, ready to go. <coughs> The software for driving wasn't written yet. 
True story. We wrote it, thank you. We wrote that software in five months. We tested it, and then we launched it at the speed of light, and it caught up with the spacecraft two months before the spacecraft got to Mars. <coughs> we had to earn our Martian, Martian driver's licenses. And we spent that whole period doing operations readiness tests, figuring out how to operate the rovers, figuring out how to operate the vehicles. Every operations readiness test was a complete, colossal failure. Remember, one of the, one of the things that we had to do <coughs> in our tests was acquire, you, you probably remember seeing them when we landed, these big panoramas, we called it our mission success panorama. One of our operations readiness tests, three quarters of that panorama just disappeared into our computers. We never found it. Imagine what that press conference would have been like. <coughs> Once we got to Mars, it all worked. Landing night was pretty tense. When it does work, it feels really, really good. Uh, we got to feel really, really good for about <coughs> 18 days. This is day 12 of the mission. One of my favorite pictures of the mission, this is the picture that proved that we had six wheels in the dirt on Mars. Eight, eight days later, things completely went to pieces. Sol 18 was spirit. We lost control of the vehicle. It looked like the mission was over. It was horrible. It was a software problem. We finally got it back. This is another one of my real favorite pictures from the mission. This is the first picture that came down after we recovered the spacecraft, and we actually had a functioning rover on Mars, three days later, opportunity landed. So it was a pretty busy time. Driving on Mars, <coughs> boy, excuse me. Driving on Mars is a difficult thing. What I wish I had, of course, is a joystick. You know, what I want to do is be able to, to drive it around rocks, but with the one-way light time delay, you can't do it. And so we've had to endow the vehicles instead with vision and intelligence and the ability to make their own decisions about what's safe and what's not. Um, and we can program different levels of courage or cowardice into the rovers depending on how tough we think the terrain is. It takes these pictures, then it generates a terrain model and figures out what to do. This is actually some data early in the mission. This is Spirit. This first part of the drive, we told the rover what to do. But from here on, the, driver, the rover's making its own decisions. So it's driving along, and right here, Finds a scary pile of rocks, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know what to do, thinks about it, says, okay, I can do this, I can do it backwards. It does make that beep, beep, beep sound as it's backing up. Another pile of rocks here, thinking about it, okay, and they told me to stop right here. All done. They're pretty smart little vehicles. Now, while the vehicles are pretty smart, sometimes the team on the ground is a little bit less so. And about 600 days into Opportunities mission, we came in one morning, and this is what we found. We were using a driving technique at that time, which I will describe charitably as bombing along at top speed with our eyes closed. Uh, we were driving over sand dunes that we thought were safe. But what happened was, at one point, the wheels broke through a crust, and we did 50 meters of wheel turns, thinking we were driving across the surface when, in fact, we were just digging deeper and deeper and deeper <laughs> into the soil. And we come in and all six wheels are buried over the hubcaps. Now, when we built the rovers, we built four. Two went to Mars, two were on Earth, and we used those to simulate <coughs> predicaments that we've gotten ourselves into and then try to figure out how to get out of that predicament. <coughs> to simulate our, this particular predicament, we needed a very large quantity of fake Martian soil. Should you ever be called upon, produce fake Martian soil, <laughs> this is the recipe you should use. <laughs> equal points, equal parts, play sand, the stuff that's used in kids' sandboxes, clay, and diatomaceous earth, the stuff that's used in swimming pool systems. Okay, and once we figured out this recipe, a bunch of engineers and pickup trucks fanned out across the LA basin and bought up literally tons of these three ingredients. People were getting algae in their swimming pools all summer long because of us. And we came back, <coughs> and we set this up, and we spent six weeks trying to rehearse, trying to figure out the optimal way to extract a robot from a sand dune on another planet. You can do lots of things. You can 
steer the wheels back and forth to open up the holes. You can rock the vehicle. You can run the wheels at different velocities. We tried all of those things and many more. We ultimately found the optimal technique, which it turns out was to put it in reverse and gun it. <laughs> There's no place you go to look this stuff up. So here we are gunning it on Mars. We had to do 192 meters worth of wheel turns to go one meter on Mars. But after six weeks, we finally popped out of this feature, which we came to call Purgatory Dune. And we've been treating those, uh, those dunes with much greater respect ever since. Our adventure has continued. I'm not going to tell you the whole story of all our discoveries. You heard a talk from Jim Bell about both curiosity and opportunity earlier today. But spirit lasted six years. Opportunity, 38 kilometers, uh, nine and a half years of operation. Saw 3,400. This was a picture a few hours ago. We're still going. Um, I thought I would put, say a word or two about this. One thing that many people have asked us over time has been, what's the secret? What was your secret? What was the secret to success on this mission? There were many, but if I had to point to one thing, if there were simply one thing that was the key to success above all else, and this is going to sound so simple-minded, but it's that we knew exactly what it was we were trying to do. We knew precisely what we were trying now that sounds idiotically simple, but I have seen more enterprises at all levels of complexity fail because everybody involved did not have a common vision of what it was they were trying to achieve. That document, I don't expect you to read it, but it's a half a piece of paper. That is the entire mission success statement for an $800 million Mars mission. That's it. You could memorize it. Sleep with it under your pillow. And the beauty of this incredibly crisp, clear description of mission success was that it, let, it lent a crystalline clarity to every decision we ever made. Do we fly this piece of hardware? Do we not? Do we hire this person? Do we not? Do we do this test? Do we not do this test? If it's necessary for mission success, you have to do it. That's it. If it's not, it's expensive. Beautifully simple. There were many times that all of us doubted whether or not we were going to succeed. But there was never a single moment on our project when any of us doubted for a second what it was precisely we were setting out to do. That was incredibly important. Let me talk a little bit about the future of Mars exploration now. <coughs> this is the plan as it exists right now. This is sort of by year, spirit and opportunity, that mission's still going. Mars Express, Odyssey, MRO, Phoenix. Here's Curiosity doing incredible stuff. MAVEN launches very soon. In 2016, ESA's Orbiter, the InSight lander doing geophysics. 2018, the very ambitious ESA ExoMars rover. And then 2020, 2020 rover. And that's the beginning of Mars sample return. This has been the holy grail of Mars science for a very long time. And that will be followed. This is where it gets a little hazy. You just get a sort of gray arrow that says future planning on, the, on the, the NASA chart. But the objective will then be to get the samples that were collected by this rover and bring them back to Earth. This is what the rover looks like and the central focus for this rover. You notice it looks like Curiosity, but it's got a very different job. Its job is to collect and cache in a little precious canister, a little thing, a little spacecraft ultimately the size of a coconut a suite of samples that would be brought back to Earth. So I thought it might be interesting to just spend a few moments talking about some of the lessons that we've learned from nine and a half years of operating rovers on Mars as they might be applied to this future problem of collecting samples. First of all, I'm really glad there's going to be a rover. Mobility is incredibly important. A huge fraction of where we explored at the Opportunity Site looked like this, sand. And if we had landed here with no mobility, all we would have seen the entire mission would have been sand and a bunch of little freaky round hematite balls, and that would have been it. Try to figure that one out. That's not a real valuable sample set to bring back to Earth. So mobility is really important. Being able to land accurately. 
is obviously important. And that's the trick that we're playing on, uh, on Curiosity. Curiosity was able to land very accurately, and so the Curiosity landing site is snugged in real close to this big, dangerous Mount Sharp. We can't land on Mount Sharp, but we can land next to it and then drive up to it. But still, mobility, even if you can land accurately, mobility is still incredibly important because you want to get diversity. This is a complicated geochemical plot, but it makes a simple point, and that is that we have found a whole bunch of different kinds of rocks with our rovers. And the reason is because we can drive so far. All those rock types that I saw you in that, that I showed you in that last plot were collected, were examined at various spots during this ascent of Husband Hill. We were not able to do that except that we had our mobility. So mobility is incredibly important. Longevity is also incredibly important. Spirit's biggest discovery, or one of the biggest discoveries, the silica at Silica Valley, was made 1,200 sols into its 90 sol mission. So I'm very, very glad that there's that big lump of plutonium on the back of this 2020 rover that's going to give it a long lifetime. Another important point, and this is really significant for thinking where we're going to land these things, it is incredibly valuable to have high resolution images for planning traverses. In fact, I claim that it's really necessary to do it right. We use it at Victoria Crater, we use it at home plate, you can see the tracks made by the rover. And my point here is that we currently have only a tiny fraction of the surface of Mars covered with these incredibly high resolution images. And yet it's necessary to have those images to operate a sample collection rover well. So unless another instrument like the high-rise camera, which is flying right now on MRO, is going to fly in the future, that means that wherever we send this rover in 2020, it's got to be somewhere in that tiny percentage of Mars that we've got good images for. It's going to really constrain the problem. Final point, there's a lot of dangerous terrain on Mars. And remember the way this mission works is this rover has to cache the samples. It's got to collect them. It's got to cache the samples, and then it's got to put that cache someplace where another rover can come and fetch it. You've got to land close to that spot. Now, some of the best places to do geology on Mars have very, very steep, dangerous, rugged terrain, and it's going to be tempting as hell to drive down into these places to get those good rocks. But if the rover can't get back out, you may never see those samples back on Earth. And so there's going to be this tension between trying to go to places that are danger enough to dangerous enough to have good rocks, but still get out again, so we had a nice safe landing zone for the vehicle that's going to come next. It's going to land alongside this thing, pick it up, and shoot those rocks back to Earth. I want to conclude tonight <coughs> by talking about the more distant future and human space flight. NASA is today beginning to develop some of the infrastructure necessary to send humans once again beyond low Earth orbit. There's the Space Launch System, SLS, initial operating capability about 70 metric tons, eventually 130-ish. This is the Orion spacecraft, can support a crew of four for about 21 days. These are building blocks. They're part of what you need to do the job, but they're only part, and there's a bunch of stuff missing. There's no plan for it, there's no money for it, and NASA is unfortunately being distracted by pressures that are being imposed on it externally by the Congress, by the White House, to do a whole bunch of different things, many of which don't have anything to do with deep space exploration. Now one of my, one of my occupational hazards is that if from time to time I'm called upon to testify before Congress about the future of NASA. Uh, I've testified several times this year. This was a hearing very recently where the witnesses were myself and then Tom Young, one of the, the real greats in the aerospace business and a, a real contributor to the history of Mars exploration. And this was what I had to say. Three themes run through my testimony. Number one, NASA needs a clear and compelling long-term long -term goal. That goal should be to send human explorers to Mars, period. NASA's, NASA's being asked to do too much with too little. There are too many distractions from that goal. And the result is wasted effort and delay. And this is, this is kind of Washington, D.C. speak. 
but it's an important point. Our nation's civil space program will be best served by having high-level policies set by the administration and Congress and implementation details recommended by NASA scientists, engineers, and managers. Back in the early 60s, President Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon, but Congress did not then dictate legis via legislation the performance capabilities of the Saturn V or exactly what sequence of missions would fly on Mercury and Gemini. They set the goal and left it to capable engineers to figure out the roadmap to, to achieve that. And so that is what I am trying to encourage to happen when I testify in my role as NASA Advisory Council Chair, et cetera, is to try to get Congress, OMB, kind of back off set the high-level goals, and then let NASA actually do the job. So to conclude, uh, Mars is a dream for all of us in this room, but we ain't going to get there by dreaming. The only way you get there is by putting your head down, and you just push, and you push, and you push, and you never, ever, ever give up. That's the only way it's going to happen. That's the way this stuff has always happened. There's, there, there, there are models that we can look to in history for things that are sort of like Mars exploration. One of my favorites is the history of exploration in Antarctica. And at the beginning, it was primitive. Primitive technology, first stumbling steps. You know, you try, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The technology is not the best, but it's what you've got. And you go there and you sometimes succeed, you sometimes fail, sometimes your spacecraft crashes, sometimes your teams die, but you learn. What then happens is ultimately the enabling technology is there. In the case of this, the, the permanent research base that exists at the South Pole Station, you put the people in place you get the job done, and you establish a permanent human pr presence in a place where humans have never been. If we've done it in Antarctica, we're going to do it at Mars. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Do you want me to do a few questions? Yeah, sure. Bring it on. Right here. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise when we actually got there? You know, I'm tempted to say that it worked. <laughs> um, with all those exploding parachutes and ripped airbags and so forth, I didn't even think we were going to get to Florida, let alone get to Mars. Um, I think the biggest surprise was was just how tremendously compelling the evidence for watery activity was right from the start at the Opportunity Site. The first 60 days at the Opportunity Site, we made, you know, 90% of the scientific discoveries that that we made in the first seven years of that mission. You know, Spirit had to climb a mountain and descend on that mountain, break its wheel, and all sorts of stuff. To, you know, 1,200, 1,500 sols to catch up with opportunity, what opportunity achieved in the first, the first two months. So yeah, I would have to say just the, the incredible pace of discovery in that first six or eight weeks with opportunity was for me the biggest surprise. I didn't think it was going to be that compelling that early. Yeah? How is opportunity's health? How is opportunity's health? For a nine and a half year old rover, damn good. <laughs> um, Let's see, we've got some dust on the solar arrays right now. We're getting by on about 380, 390 watt hours uh, per sol these days, which is low, but workable. It's, you know, winter is coming on. Um, let's see, uh, all six wheels are good. They're doing fine. One of the steering actuators, the right front steering actuator, doesn't turn anymore, so that's a little bit of an issue when we're trying to turn, but not much. The biggest issue that we have is on the, on the, the rover, on the vehicle itself, is that the shoulder joint on the arm that's supposed to move it this way doesn't work anymore. So when we want to move it that way, we got to move the whole vehicle, okay? Um, of the scientific payload, six, we got six instruments, four of them are fine, doing just great. 
the infrared spectrometer, unfortunately we voided the warranty on that thing when we had a problem with the thermal system on the vehicle. We had to turn off the nighttime survival heaters for that, for that instrument and we eventually broke it because it just got too cold. And then the Moss Power spectrometer, great instrument, depends on a radiation source of cobalt 57. Cobalt 57 has a half-life of 271 days. And when you're planning a 90-day mission, that seems like a really long time. <laughs> Uh, we've been through 12 half-lives now, so that, that instrument doesn't work out. But the vehicle is really doing great. Uh, right there. The, the Martian hemispheric dichotomy, why does that exist? Um, <coughs> the leading idea, I believe, for that idea, for that observation these days is that early in its history, Mars suffered a very large impact that just blew a lot of the crustal material off the northern hemisphere and, and so thinned the northern crust and thickened the, the southern crust. And then when it isostatically adjusts, the, the north sits lower than the south. Yeah. How much, how much water is there on Mars? That's a really, really good question. I mean, the, the the units that one could conveniently use to describe the amount of water on Mars is equivalent liquid water depth if you had a, an ocean and you spread it uniformly over the whole planet. Reasonable numbers, I'm waving my hands here. Reasonable numbers are maybe 100 meters, okay? So I'm talking about all the ice that's in the polar caps, all the ice that's beneath the ground, the total endowment of water on Mars there is reason to believe, based on isotopic ratios and so forth, that a reasonable guess might be if you could put it all at the surface in, in a single layer, 100 meters. But that's a wild guess. Yeah? Airplanes, yeah, there have been a bunch of missions. I mean, the ratio of good ideas for Mars missions to Mars missions that actually fly is very, very high. And there are, there are uh, yeah, there, for example, there are, there are missions for, there are airplane missions. There was the Ares mission. Yeah, I, my, I, was I was a member of the Ares mission team. My wife loved that one. It flies for four hours and then it crashes. It's done. <laughs> she thought that was great. Um, but uh, there are a lot of concepts out there. They're competing with one another. The only ones that are selected are the ones that I showed you on that chart. And a mission ain't a mission until somebody's willing to pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to make it happen. <laughs> there are ideas galore. Ideas are cheap. Yeah. Uh, there certainly were a lot of lessons learned uh, transferred across. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the design of that vehicle, it has a number of of elements in common with some of the things that we've done. Some that are quite different as well. Some that are very innovative. So, you know, I would say that they, they looked at what we did, they learned from what we did, and then they applied some very cre creative ideas of their own. So it's a mix. Yeah. Me personally? Oh boy, if I could go to Mars. Can I bring stuff back with me or not? Okay, so one-way trip. If it was a one-way trip, I'm not going, okay? <coughs> but, it, you know, if I could bring stuff back with me, then, of course, I'd be thinking, well, this is Mars sample return, and I've got uh, I've to pick my choice carefully for scientific purposes. But I think the, the essence of your question was where would I most like to go on Mars? You know, if you just set me down, give me five minutes to poke around a little bit and then come home, I think I'd pick Eagle Crater place where we landed with, with opportunity, that, that place has some very special meaning to me. Always does. That would be the place. Yeah, way in the back. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, that comes down to what's the inventory of carbonate rocks on the surface. Carbonate rocks are a lot harder to find on Mars than everybody thought they were going to be. Okay, for years the idea was there was a you know four or five bar CO2 atmosphere, dense greenhouse, 
it all got locked up in limestone and, and it's going to be everywhere. Turns out the stuff is really hard to find. I mean, we have found carbonates. Uh, we found some wonderful carbonate outcrops with, with spirit and carbonate has been detected from orbit via infrared spectroscopy, but there's not a lot of it. So um, the total inventory, I wouldn't even want to hazard a guess. I mean, the, you, you can make some guesses, as I said, of the water inventory, but, but uh, boy, trying to get at the, because there are a number of ways to arrive at that number. Trying to arrive at a total CO2 endowment locked up on Mars is very hard to do. The problem is there, there are other ways to do a greenhouse. You know, methane, ammonia, they're great greenhouse gases, so it wasn't necessarily even CO2 that did it. So, man, I don't know. I really, really don't know. Right there. What point do you pull the plug on a flagship mission? <laughs> There's no one size fits all answer to that question. You know, I wish I could give you one. I think the primary criterion that you should use for deciding whether or not to pull the plug on a flagship is your decision process should be forward looking rather than backward looking. I think, you, I think it's a mistake to make a decision on the basis of sunk costs. We've spent so much, therefore, we've spent too much money, we should stop spending money now. Or, I've also seen, we've spent so much, we can't quit now. Okay, you, I, I've seen both of those. I think both of those are the wrong way to look at it. What you need to do is look at where are we today? What are the problems? What's required to solve them? Are there unsolvable problems? How much money is it going to take us to get there, and is it worth that additional money to get the job done? Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not, but I think you should make your decision based on work to go and money to be spent instead of basing it on yesterday because yesterday is gone. So that being the case, how does one know that if there wasn't a third one, that the mission would have been three times as successful as this mission? In other words, that it, it, Mars is so big and varied yes. that it's quite possible that you discoveries that were made after we came down off of Hudson Hull with that rover, um, I, would, I would stack Spirit and up, Spirit and Opportunity just about side by side against each other in terms of their accomplishments. But the good stuff with Spirit can be late in the day. Your point, though, is absolutely correct. And that is we got almost twice as much science by flying two as we would have by flying one. And yet the additional cost of flying the second one did not come anywhere close to doubling the cost of the mission. I think if you flew five of them, you'd get five times the science. Ten of them, ten times the science. I mean, at some point, you're going to start seeing the same things over again. But my goodness, you look at what Curiosity has found, nothing like the Spirit and Opportunity science. It's all brand new. Mars is an incredibly complex place with an incredible amount of variety and diversity. You know, I often think of the parable of the blind men and the elephant, right? And one says an elephant's like this. And, you know, it, 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 this is a really complicated elephant. And we've only looked at two, now three spots. There's enormous payoff from going to multiple places on the Martian surface, no question. Yeah, right here. Would it be possible to take that rover that I showed you and send it to Mars? 
Hell no. That thing is so beat up. It's not, it's not like, <clears throat> I mean, it's not like a, a, a rover, a piece of hardware that you lovingly create and via the same process that you use to send something off to Mars, and then you place it into bonded stores and, and you know, armed guards stand look, watching over it. We, we, oh, this thing is so beat up. I mean, if you actually saw that thing closed up, it is scratched, it is bloodied and beaten, and no, you'd never send that to Mars. I wouldn't trust that to go to the Mojave Desert. Yeah. If it works, if the funds can be raised, if the mission can be flown, if people can do it and come back alive, I think it's going to be tremendously energizing. I don't think there's any question about it. But uh, you know, every time you conceive of a Mars mission, there are many hurdles ahead. And there are a lot of hurdles ahead for that project. I wish them well. Yeah, way in the back. What's my feeling about methane? Uh, this is a tough one. <coughs> this is a tough one. Um, the best observations of methane have been done via ground-based telescopes. Uh, they have looked very interesting. At the same time, they have come under serious challenge by very serious scientists who have poked at those observations and, and caused people to question whether or not they were valid. It's a very difficult measurement to make. You know, there's methane in the atmosphere of Earth. You've got to take that out. There's so many things that you have to take out. The best way to do it is to try what the Europeans are going to do in 2016 and send a spacecraft with a payload that's optimized to answer that question. Um, you know, you can try to sniff it out on the ground. We've tried that with Curiosity, and we haven't, haven't found methane yet. But, you know, that's just one little spot on the ground, and it's really a global problem. So I think the jury is out, and that 2016 European mission is, I think, going to answer the question. Uh, yeah. NASA enterprise is different from the motivation behind a, a private company, okay? Uh, NASA is an organization that since its inception has always been about doing the next thing, the next thing that's new, the next thing that's different, and coming up with something, you know, dramatically new. And, you know, frankly, I'm thrilled to see that the 2020 rover looks just like Curiosity with the same entry, descent, and landing system, we're going to fly the sky crane again. It, we know that it works, and we're going to use it. So maybe some of these lessons are being learned. I, honestly, if you tried to be, build Spirit and Opportunity again today, you couldn't do it. You, could, you couldn't even get to Mars. You know, the avionics in particular have just completely changed. Yeah. What, oh, my favorite surprise. Wow. Um, that's a hard one because there have been so many, you know, I mean, there have been a few that were just sort of laugh out loud crazy when we, I mean, the first time we found an iron meteorite, I was just stunned. You know, I was just absolutely stunned. I mean, we had gone to investigate our heat shield, which had, you know, fallen off the vehicle and crashed on the surface. And we drive up to the heat shield and right next to it, there's this shiny metal thing and it's an iron meteorite. Just sitting there. I mean, I told the team we shouldn't stand here. This is obviously a place where big metal objects fall from the sky. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I mean, I was just stunned when we saw that. Now we've now it's like, pfft, another meteorite. Let's go, because um, we found so many of them. Um, man, the first time we saw a dust devil dancing across. I mean, we knew those were there. We knew meteorites had to be there too. Um, the silica, Silica Valley. That was a big one. 
I was stunned by that one. 91% pure silicate, just popped out of nowhere. It's, it's hard for me to pick. I mean, there are some that are tremendous scientific discoveries, and then there's other ones where you just go, holy moly, have you done that yet? Hard to pick. Yeah. The most important thing is keep the pressure on, okay? Uh, advocacy, groups, advocacy groups are not going to, for the most part, raise the funds that are necessary to do these multi-billion dollar enterprises. That's not what it's about. But what advocacy groups do is they are a constant source of pressure, an unrelenting source of pressure on decision makers saying, yeah, this is important. Yeah, remember, this is important. Oh, don't forget, this is important. And you just can never let up. You can never, ever, ever let up, okay? And as soon as you let up, people forget, and they go on to the next thing. But if there's this constant drumbeat out there, of we care about this, we care about this, people care about this, um, it makes an enormous difference. And, you know, the number of people who are willing to come to a conference like this and pay to attend, and, and, and you, you're the tip of the spear. Okay, but there's an enormous body of people out there who are fascinated by Mars exploration who, you know, they don't go to the effort of being members of the Mars Society, but they still really care. And you'd be amazed at how small a, um, a number of letters say to Congress, how much of a difference. It, I remember one time I was talking, this wasn't that many years ago, I, or there was some NASA program that I was trying to advocate and I was visiting some members of Congress and talking to their staffers and one of the staffers said, oh yeah, we've been getting a lot of letters on that one. And I said, just out of curiosity, this is one particular congressional district, how many letters have you gotten? He said, oh, I think we've gotten five or six letters. And I go, five or six? And he said, well, yeah, we subscribe to the cockroach theory. If you see five or six of them in your kitchen, there's a lot of them back in the walls. <laughs> okay, so. You, you matter more than you think you do. You really do, and just keeping that pressure on, it's, it's tremendously important. Yes? Do I think we'll see humans on Mars in my lifetime? I, uh, I don't run anymore, but I cycle a lot. I swim. Uh, I watch my cholesterol. I've been trying real hard to, to, to watch what I eat, keep my blood pressure down. Going to D.C. doesn't help with that. Um, I think it could. I'm 57 years old. My dad's 86. He's doing well. 29 years. Yeah, he can be on Mars. Okay, what are the criteria for what samples to gather? Um, well, obviously you're looking for diversity, but the, the primary criterion that's going to be used for selecting the site and selecting the samples is maximizing the probability that they will preserve evidence of biology or prebiotic chemistry. Okay, so you're going to be looking for places where there was water, and then you're going to be looking for either very fine grain sediments or precipitated minerals because those are the kinds of materials that best preserve primitive organic matter. And so, yeah, that, those are going to be the primary criteria, is, is, primary criteria is, is maximizing the preservation potential for evidence of life. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the question had to do with uh, getting beyond surface ge geology and getting below the surface. I think that's tremendously important. I think it's one of the most important things that we can do. Um, in fact, Robert and I were talking about this over dinner, is you know, how deep do you have to drill to find liquid water? It's a very complicated question. It has to do with the chemistry of the water, you know, what salts are dissolved in it, so what's the freezing point? 
what's the geothermal heat flux, you know, it's going to vary a lot from place to place. And so I think one of the primary objectives for geologic exploration would be to locate the places that are the best ones to drill. And then drill baby drill. Uh, radar is certainly one tool uh, that you can use. Ground penetrating radar is tough on Mars, as it turns out, because the, the Martian subsurface is very geometrically complicated. A lot of it is impact generated regolith into those big boulders and chunks of stuff. And so what you would like to see be a nice, clean radar signal going down and coming back. You get a lot of reflections and refractions, and it's pretty messy. But radar is certainly one thing to use. Um, any measurements that you can make of heat flow and how it varies from place to place are going to be valuable. Certainly, we, we talked about methane, OK? Uh, there are hints from these controversial Earth-based methane observations that are, there are specific source regions for methane on the Martian surface. If, those, if that turns out to be correct, based on what we see from that European mission of 16, those, those source regions would be particularly valuable places to go and drill in. You need to have both at the same time. Uh, certainly, we have found that um, orbiters can play a very important tactical role in helping to make decisions in real time. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm giving away too many secrets here. We just recently asked the uh, high rise instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to do some special observations for us of infrared spectroscopy at Salander Point, which is this place that we're just climbing up to, that, that picture that I showed you from Salander Point, um, with opportunity as a way to help guide us to where we think there might be clay minerals. This is an observation they just did for us in the last few weeks. So operations, I mean, besides the obvious, po obvious point that, that orbiters provide relay, data relay capability for the assets on the surface, Having assets in orbit that can do specific, uh, specific observations in support of, of surface measurements is tremendously valuable. So I think you want to fly both at the same time. Yeah. I'll warn you, by the way, I can do this all night. So <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Okay, the worst message you could take away from the longevity of the MER rovers is that somehow we figured things out. Okay, to a certain extent, we've gotten lucky. Um, we used incredibly primitive technology on our rovers. We did not, there's the only new technology on those vehicles really is, the, is in the software. The hardware is all tried and true, tested stuff. Um, we've gotten lucky with the weather. We've gotten lucky with a bunch of things. Um, Mars is hard. It's going to stay hard. And I think it would be a mistake to draw any lessons from opportunity and spirits longevity other than over design and test and test and test. What do I know about the ca capabilities of the Chinese in this area? Not a whole lot, to be honest with you. Um, they have expressed an interest um, in doing things like rovers on the moon and Mars. I, I remember seeing in the aerospace media a picture of a proposed Chinese rover. And if uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, we were, we were very flattered by the design of their vehicle. Um, it was interestingly, though, I think for the moon. But anyway, um, to be honest, I don't know about their capabilities for robotic surface missions anywhere. Um, they are in the process of developing some very significant capabilities for human space flight in low Earth orbit, okay, with their missions to their, their space station. Uh, they're flying, you know, they've joined the family of nations that can go it alone and do orbital space flight. And there aren't too many of them. 
students. So uh, they're serious and they're getting better. They're climbing that learning curve real fast. So I would not sell the Chinese short at all. They're going to do a lot. Yeah. There are many. There are many, many things. And um, those of us who are so fortunate as to be able to be entrusted with hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of taxpayer money need to take this issue very, 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 very seriously. Okay? When we launched our vehicles, the mission cost $800 million, didn't know if it was going to work or not, and we expected to put two rovers on the surface for 90 days each, total of 188 days. To do the math, that worked out to $4.5 million a day. I drilled that number into my team's head. I wanted everybody scared. I wanted everybody coming into JPL every day thinking, holy moly, we got to do $4.5 million worth of science today. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just finish with this, because this is an important point, okay? We're not doing this for fun. We're not doing this just because we like to send rovers to Mars. The missions that we fly had better be worth it to the taxpayers or we don't deserve to fly them. And that, that, re that applies to human missions to Mars, it, re it applies to the Hubble Space Telescope, it applies to anything that we do in space. Now, what are we getting for our $800 million on MER? I feel like what we're doing is making progress towards answering basic questions like are we alone in the universe and how did life first arise? I sleep okay at night, having spent 800, 900 now million dollars on these things. But it's a, it's for all of us who are advocates of Mars exploration, this is a question we all better be really ready to answer when we're asked. Because if it ain't worth the money to the people who are paying for it, it shouldn't happen. Go ahead. Is there a goal? For Mars exploration or more broadly? For Mars exploration, I would say that the goal, first and foremost, is to determine. I'll give you two goals. One is to determine whether or not life ever took hold on independently on another world. Because if it happened twice in just this solar system, then it takes no great leap of logic, imagine faith, imagination, faith, or anything else to believe that it could be commonplace throughout the universe. Second scientific goal for the exploration of Mars is let's suppose that that happened. Let's suppose that miracle of the origin of life did take place on Mars. Now it happened on Earth, we know that because here we are. But it happened early in the Earth's history and the problem is Earth has been so active throughout its history that evidence of that event is forever gone. The Earth's tectonic and volcanic history have completely destroyed evidence of the origin of life. We can never find that evidence. It's gone for good. Mars is covered with four to four and a half billion year old rocks. So if life did take hold on Mars, not only could we perhaps discover that fact, but we might even find out how it happened. That story still written in stone on the surface of Mars. And to me, scientifically, that makes it worth doing. You know, I wish it had been a crinoid. I really, really do. Um, I live in uh, upstate New York where there are lots and lots of uh, Devonian rocks, 350 million old rocks with lots of crinoid fossils in them. And uh, the particular thing that you're referring to doesn't look anything like a crinoid or like anything else that appears to be a fossil. It's some probably some coarse grain mineral crystals. Um, honestly, once we had looked at it with every spectrometer that we had, once we had looked at it with our microscopes, we had nothing left we could do except see what was underneath it. So that's what we did. 
The images exist, all the data exists, we did grind it away, and that was my decision. It was the right thing to do. Yeah? I would say that the report that you're referring to has not had a deeper penetrating f effect or a chilling effect on NASA's desire to explore. Uh, I think that NASA feels that its mandate is to explore the solar system and it's taken that seriously and we're doing the best that we can here at Full Stop. Oh, no, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, co so, so would we withhold the data? No, I'm trying to do that. Okay, no, no, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question. You know, our, our, on our mission, we made the decision very early on that we were going to pipeline our data, everything, straight to the World Wide Web, untouched by human hands. We still do that to this day. So, you know, this is... a. This audience probably knows this already, but one of the things that I love to do when I give talks like this is I put up images like I just put up, and I say, and this just came down from Mars a few hours ago, and everybody goes, ooh, like I tapped into some secret NASA database. No, <laughs> I just downloaded it from the same website that everybody else does. Um, but uh, there was never on our mission any discussion at all, ever, of withholding any data from being sent down right away with a single exception. There was one exception very early in the mission, okay? And that was that on the back of the high gain antenna, there was a memorial plaque for the Columbia crew. And we wanted to get that image down and get it beautifully processed and make sure it was okay with the family of the families of the Columbia astronauts before we released it. Those are the only images in 3,400 solids that we ever held back. Everything else just goes straight to the web, and if there's a giraffe running through the scene, you'll see it when I do. <laughs> Three, more Three more questions. Okay, one right here. You're asking me to give away too many secrets here. I got a few ideas. Um, the question is, what would be like the, the top thing that you would want to do now from orbit on Mars, given the current state of things? You know, I'll just say flat out, I think one of the main things would be to do really, really high spatial resolution, very high signal noise ratio infrared spectroscopy. I, that, would, that would be at the top of my list. Two more, right here. for in-situ propellant production that a hard-nosed project manager or a hard-nosed NASA manager would be willing to risk a $10 billion mission. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there are better ways to do everything that we do, okay? There are, those are all things we know how to do. Those are all things that we actually have experience with in space flight. So it's, 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 we tend to take a very, very conservative approach. Okay. Well, 
if, if it is possible to demonstrate with sufficient, sufficient robustness the ability to do that, and in so doing, increase the reliability and lower the cost of sample return, it'll happen. So far, it hasn't taken place to my satisfaction. One more, last one, right here. Your personal opinion, are you going to find life? My personal opinion, are we going to find life on Mars? That's a great question to end on. Okay, I will give you my answer, and I want to make a specific one to this. I don't know. <laughs> and, and, but I, I want to make, but I want to make a very important point. Here. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make when you're a scientist or an explorer is to wish for an answer. And one of the, 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 the saying that I've heard scientists use is, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Okay? You don't want to fall into that trap. And so my view has always been that ra rather than guessing whether or not there's life on Mars, rather than wishing for there to have been life on Mars, I just want to keep an open mind and build a better experiment. Thank you.